I always say this, you know, you can be a boss, but being a boss doesn't automatically make you a leader. And in my view, a leader is only a leader when people willingly want to follow them. They got some kind of quality or characteristic about them. And obviously you've had that because, uh, you know, you've had a lot of success, tremendous success. I mean, what is it, the fourth or fifth biggest pizza franchise in the, in the world? So what is it? Obviously determination. You obviously know how to get around people, how to work with them and how to inspire them and motivate them enough to want to follow you into this entire venture. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is very good, very blessed on this end. And as always, we give God all the praise, honor, and glory for that. Well, I'm feeling good today. I'm actually in Utah. I left my house this morning in uh, Newport Beach, flew to Utah, where it's crazy. Snow everywhere. It's the middle of April. People are skiing, snow everywhere. It's probably going to be here at least for another month, but it looks beautiful. This is a beautiful state. Why am I here? I am meeting with uh, John Schnatter. For those of you that don't know who he is, he is the founder of Papa John's Pizza. Now, I know there's a lot of you out there that love Papa John's. Great pizza, but a great story. Great American story. A guy that really came from nothing other than a solid family. So important. Loves his family, grandparents, parents, had a solid upbringing, but he started this in a garage, in a, in a back room. And uh, the story is great because he had a car that he sold. I believe he got 1600 bucks, and that's how he started Papa John's Pizza. So when you talk about determination, you talk about leadership, you talk about an entrepreneur, this is John's story. And uh, we're going to get into it. And then something happened, which... I don't think any of us should really appreciate, but we're going to get into that. Uh, great interview. I'm sure we're all going to enjoy it. Can't wait to sit down with you. Here's John. Well, John, pleasure to meet you. I've been looking forward to this. I've, uh, I've followed your career for quite a while. I have uh, a good relationship with a lot of friends of yours, people that worked with you and around you. And uh, this is great. Yeah. Great to come to your, uh, your state here. And, yeah. Sit down, have a nice chat. Yeah, it's good to have you. This yeah. is my home, so welcome. <laughs> well, let me tell you this. I want you to be relaxed. I don't think there was ever any mob in Utah. That's one place we didn't get to. <laughs> is that so, right? Yeah. You, yeah. Still, you kind of feel like a fish out of water then, huh? <laughs> well, not really. No. You know, actually, I feel better because it's better that, uh, that nobody's here. But, you know, listen, I, I am around a lot of people, successful people. Uh, in your case, it's wildly successful. And um, I do a lot of things regarding leadership. I do conferences and so on and so forth. And, you know, fascinating story how you got started. And I know it began with a, with a car. <laughs> so maybe you can tell us about that. Well, we, you know, from the get-go, we just had great team um, teammates. Um, and, um, you know, leadership is real simple. It's you get behind somebody, or someone, or a concept, or a combination uh, thereof, if you think they're going to make your life better. And for some reason, we always really attracted great people. Uh, mm -hmm. Denise Robinson, who I talked to this morning, first employee, has been with me 40 years. Um, Sonny at the bar. Um, we had Bob Erringer, uh, folks like Simon Smith. We, we just always had great people, and I, they were just attracted to the quality of the product and um, you know what we believed in. And so <clears throat> we built it out of principles and values. Um, we were broke. First Papa John's in the broom closet, which we built for about 1600 bucks. We didn't have a sign on the door because we thought if you took care of your people and you made the best pizza, you'd win. We just thought that way. And then we opened um, the store adjacent to the bar and put a sign on the front door and sales went from 3000 a week to 9000 And I went, wow, you put a sign on the front door, mm. you know, then this goes up. So we didn't understand marketing. All we understood was uh, value in people respecting people, hiring the best people, and then making a, a great product. Um, so uh, for some reason, people early on just thought we were going to do well. And so they believed in me and believed in Papa John's. 
and then we we got we had a great team. We had um, you know the right people on the bus. We had them in the right seat, and they built one hell of a company. Well, let me ask you, why pizza? What what gave you that idea? Well, I flipped hamburgers at uh, Wendy's. Mm -hmm. um, I hated the hamburger business. I hated the grease and all that. Drove a forklift at uh, Cut Rate Liquors. That was okay, you know, something to do. But I got a job when I was 15 washing dishes at Rockies. I had to have my parents sign a permit to let me, because I wasn't 16. And I hated washing dishes. <clears throat> and uh, right across from where you wash dishes was where they made pizzas. And uh, Rocky Sub Pub, where I washed dishes, was owned by the Fondrisi brothers, John, Frank, and Joe. And you weren't allowed to make a pizza unless you were a Fondrisi. And so I'd get to watch Joe Fondrisi make pizza all day long, and I'd wash dishes, and I hated washing dishes. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to make pizza. Um, I loved the dough. I loved spreading the sauce. Uh, we, at the time, we had Blodgett ovens, which are good ovens, not as good as the Baker Prides that we ended up with. But just everything about it, uh, I just loved it. And at Cut Rate Liquors and that forklift, we'd buy a case of beer for 9 bucks and sell it for nine eighty, eighty 80 cents gross profit. At Rockies, we sell a pizza for nine bucks and have three dollars in it. And I'd mm. said, you know, just the gross margin of pizza versus a, a commodity like beer kind of intrigued me. So they had a write up in the Saturday scene at the Courier Journal, blew the doors off the place, and the Fondrisis went from, you know, serving spaghetti and making pizzas to the front of the house where they were kind of the host. I got promoted from washing dishes to making pizzas, and I fell in love with making pizzas. Um, I was dating one of the waitresses at the time, just a, a, a great young lady, and um, she would come in after work and order pizzas with her girlfriends, and I'd write, I love you, and pepperonis on the pizza. <laughs> so I just, I had an affection, affinity for pizzas since I was 15. Made pizzas at Greek's Pizzeria in college. Uh, the Greek, Chris Caramassini, talked to him yesterday, um, and, and, and Chris really taught me volume. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do 8,000 a week in pizza at Rockies, and, and at Greeks, we do $4,000 a day. And so um, I had this um, institutional knowledge. Uh, I was at Domino's, did a little stint there, did some things at uh, Mr. Gaddy's Pizza, of course, the Rocky Sub Pub and Greeks. So I just went around and took all the best ideas. I thought Greeks had the best sauce. I thought um, uh, Rocky's uh, had the best cheese with the Munster blend. Uh, Carl's Bakery helped me make the, the dough recipe. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, quality always takes time and costs more money. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we understood early on that, you know, the cheap stuff, the commodities were cheap stuff and commodities. And the better beefs, the better sauces, the fresh veggies were something you had to pay up for. So we had a good base with the dough, the sauce, and the cheese because of my history with uh, Domino's, uh, Gaddy's, uh, Rockies, and Greeks. And then the rest of it was just common sense. And we kind of brought it all together and stole everybody's best ideas and created Papa John's. Well, I got to say, we have something in common. When I was uh, 16 years old, um, I grew up in New York. I worked at a place right across the street from Kennedy Airport. It was called the Big Bow Wow. And <laughs> uh, I was making pizza. And I loved it. I enjoyed the process, but I liked it more because all the young girls would come and sit in front of me. And as I'm making pizza, they'd watch. I'd spin it and throw it up in the air. And I had a great time. I wish I had your vision, you know, to create something like you did at Papa John's. Uh, uh, it would have been nice. But anyway, I just enjoyed making pizza. You know, it was interesting. Let's see, the first Papa John's, that we're talking 84. So I'm, I'm 22, because that's April. Mm -hmm. um, and I was born in November. You know, we had the value system from my, my parents and grandparents as far mm -hmm. as, you know, work hard, get ahead, long hours, be accountable, save your money, be responsible, work ethic. And then we had the piece of make a great product, authenticity, and make it real. And then we had the people side of it. My dad and my grandfather were people people. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had the culture from the get go. So we, we get out of that broom closet doing three grand a week and we open that store doing nine. And I'm twenty two and you know, I'm a high strung mammal you know, at 22. Um, and I go down the Domino's, and I walk in there, Papa John shirt, I said, what are you doing a week? He said, we're doing, you know, 5,500, 6,000 a week. And I look at this manager, I said, I'm gonna kick your ass in the whole world. Now, that's crazy. Mm. I mean, Domino's probably had three, four, 5,000 stores at the time, we had one store. And I just thought if you can whoop them, 
and kick their butt in Jefferson, Indiana, you could beat them in the whole world. Mm. Now, why I thought like that, I have no idea because, you know, that's, that's just not <laughs> logical. Yeah, at the um, time, right. At the time. But we just believed if um, we had those fundamental principles in place and made a good product, we were going to win. And we just had a, a winner's mindset. We just didn't understand the concept of losing. Well, you know, John, you give a lot of credit to the team, which, which I appreciate. But, you know, I always say this, you know, you can be a boss, but being a boss doesn't automatically make you a leader. And in my view, a leader is only a leader when people willingly want to follow them. They got some kind of quality or characteristic about them. And obviously you've had that because, uh, you know, you've had a lot of success, tremendous success. I mean, what is it, the fourth or fifth biggest pizza franchise in the, in the world? So what is it? Obviously determination, you obviously know how to get around people, how to work with them, and how to inspire them and motivate them enough to want to follow you into this entire venture. Well, to your point, the, the customer experience can never exceed the employee experience. Just can't. Interesting. I mean, if you've got miserable employees, you're going to have miserable customer experience. So um, the employees have to feel proud of what they're doing. And you don't control people. You know, you're not a boss. People control themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think you've got to give them an environment where they get the resources, they get the direction, and when they do it right, you know, they, they're incentivized, both mm -hmm. in promotions and financially, but, you know, as much emotionally and as spiritually as you make them feel good at what they're doing. Not the happiest days I had at Papa John's when I was there is when we give people raises. Mm. You know, we, 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 were, we, we had people start out at five, six bucks an hour, and when I left, we're making five million bucks a year. I mean, you know, million bucks a year, two million bucks a year. Um, we created some 10,000 millionaires. But, you know, I think if you lead by example and you walk the talk, you know, people talk the talk, but mm -hmm. they don't walk the talk. And so if you're not willing to get in and make pizzas and clean stores and visit stores, I mean, the we've been taken over at Papa John's by the corporate. I, I hate saying corporate idiots, but they're, they're corporate idiots. Um, we have a situation now where we have a CEO that, the problem is not that he's incompetent. The problem is he's incompetent. And he thinks he's he's incompetent. And he thinks he's competent. Mm -hmm. If somebody's incompetent and they know they're incompetent, you kind of work with them. Right. But you got somebody that's incompetent and they you know you got an emperor with no clothes kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a toughie. But you know I hear people are lazy and they don't want to work. Um, I'm not, I, we never saw that at Papa John's and there was just um, a mindset and pride, dignity and integrity that better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's wasn't a slogan. It, if you say better, mm -hmm. then you know, the consumer, you better have a better location, better be cleaner, uh, you better have happier employees, uh, better pizza. I mean, the word better lifts the whole um, organization up. People want to be accountable. People mm -hmm. want to do a good job. If you look at the framers and the Constitution and how they stumbled upon this, in 1776, the pursuit of life, happiness, or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, life's a no-brainer. You know, you've seen that game. That's mm -hmm. a losing hand. Uh, liberty is when you go about your day and the um, government leaves you alone. Mm -hmm. But pursuit of happiness. What do the framers mean by that? And we've studied the psychology behind that. And again, how they stumbled upon this, I have no idea. But happiness is overcoming a difficult task. You know, when you do a good job with one of your podcasts or somebody puts a 10 hour day in or Simon and his team are making great pizza and sales are going up, that, that's happiness. When you make a contribution to your fellow man, you make other people's lives better, you make your life better. We learned early on that, um, you know, we set goals, make sure they're achievable, mm -hmm. make sure they're measurable, make sure they're doable, <clears throat> make sure they're very clear, they're transparent. People like achievement. People mm -hmm. like being responsible. Um, and if you're in an environment where the leaders are not responsible, you know, for example, back to Papa John's today, the, the guy in the C-suite at the top, he couldn't make a pizza if he had to. He probably hadn't been in a Papa John's store and, you know, since he's been there. I mean, you know, if you're not out in the restaurants and where the rubber meets the road, seeing what the people that really are doing the heavy lifting, Mm -hmm. um, and that's what bothers me about this country right now is uh, the people that might wake up every day and make this country great so we can live the life we live, they're getting hurt. And that's just wrong. And when you see people done wrong and they're doing right, uh, that infuriates me. Um, 
but uh, I think if you if you set realistic, fair goals, you incentivize, and you hold people accountable, they seem to flourish. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? Uh, I mean, obviously you've treated them well. You know, we were having this discussion with someone in the car as we were coming over here. You've got to have empathy with your employees. You've got to be understanding of them also. You know, rather than being so rigid and so strict if a mistake is made or something, they're not performing up to their capability. How do you deal with that? Well, I think you embrace mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurship is tinkering. You mm -hmm. know, you tinker until you, you actually do it wrong. And once you figure out how to do it right, you'll make the same mistakes over and over again. But, you know, I've been out of the business for four years. The reason that I think I've been able to weather this, this nonsense, this onslaught of, uh, you know, false narrative, is we ran the company with principles. We never lied or cheated in business. We never took shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And we brought everybody up with it. I think that's been my savior is we did it right. Now, to your point, um, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, self-divulge, when you're running 5,000 restaurants and you're selling a million pizzas a day and you're a public company, so you've got some earnings you're chasing and all that, mm -hmm. you got to make the numbers, you know, um, you got to make the, the bean counters happy. You do lose a little bit of the human side of it. And we, we always treated people with kindness and respect. We always were fair. We always created win-wins. We always were positive attitude. Um, always had accountability. We always were superior in our performance. But when you're on that hamster wheel, you do lose a little bit of that. And I look back, was it egregious or was it bad? No. The, when you get to step away from it, and we did it the right way, and ever, it was a win-win deal, mm -hmm. um, but I think um, you get to step away from it and you get off the hamster wheel, you do have more heart. Um, and um, that's one thing that's been refreshing is, you know, um, when you're not chasing your tail every day with 100,000 employees, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you get to sit back and kind of watch what really happened, it makes me more, more humble more gracious, more mm. appreciative of what happened. Um, would I have done it differently? We went through so many different phases. We went from, you know, 83 to 94 where we're broke. We're mm. fear of failure. You know, you're operating from the worst in you. You're not operating from, you know, like Jack Nicholas always operated from the best inning. He was mm -hmm. always playing to the best inning, whereas you know, some athletes are just scared of failing. You know, scared mm -hmm. of missing. You don't want to get. We we did that from '83 to '93, '94, and then we made a lick. We went public, and we were we're all rich, but we still had the mindset of we were broke. I mean, I remember the company was worth two, three hundred million dollars, and I still was worried they were going to turn off the electricity mm. and the water. Um, and um, I finally had a, a guy that was a coach in the mid late '90s. Um, he looked at me and he said, um, "When are you going to realize Vietnam's over?" I said, what do you mean? He goes, it's over. You made it. They're not going to turn off your electricity. They're not going to turn off your water. You've made it. And it's stuck. And from there, we evolved into operating out of the best in us. Um, and that run from 2000 to 2004, where we fixed the fundamentals, mm -hmm. that was introduced a lot of principles. That was, that was a lot of fun. And then I stepped down in 05 at 45 bucks a share hired a professional manager, and then by 2009, they had the stock at 680 a share. I had 10 mm -hmm. million shares. So I had to go back in 2009, and the run from 2009 with folks like Simon and the team to 2016, we took it from 680 a share to 88 bucks a share. That was the part where I really enjoyed doing what I did every day. I felt like we, we were principle-centered and, and oriented, uh, we were paying some 30 million a year in bonuses. Some employees felt like uh, it was their business, their company. I mean, we had um, three gyms in the building. We had walking trails. Mm. We had yoga classes. We had a doctor's office. We had a Starbucks. 30 million a year in bonuses. It, it really was a, a good situation. I can remember in 2015 and 16, the executive team. And, you know, all these folks started believing their own headlines and. Yeah. I forgot the element of graciousness and humbleness and I sensed it and I didn't know what to do about it and I was very vocal. I said, Hey, we have private aircraft. <laughs> we have we're making two hundred million a year in even all. Don't F this up. Do not screw this up. Mm -hmm. This is as good as it gets. 
And, you know, I don't know if it's just the male ego or just people think, well, you make it look easy. Because when you're good at something, you make it look easy. Tiger, when he hits a golf ball, mm -hmm. it, it looks like it's effortless, you know. You just, right. And uh, we, were, we were really good. We were good at business from the get-go. We were good at making pizzas. And we were the best place to work in Kentucky for five straight years. So that was, um, that was a lot of fun. And then um, and when you're making 200 million a year and you're getting the attention that you get being Papa John and you make it look easy, you, know, you get people around you, you get Brutuses around you, yeah. you get traitors, and you get, uh, you get betrayed. And so we kind of lived that the last three years. Um, but um, if I had it over again, and, and, and I'd, lo I'd love to hear Simon's perspective on this, I would have probably had a little more empathy and I wasn't tough. I was tough, but I wasn't ruthless. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I never negotiated standards. Because when you, when you hold people to low standards, you're telling them, I really don't believe in you. When you hold people to high levels of accountability and standards, you're saying, I think you can do it. Yeah. I, so you're actually, it's, you know, it's a reverse of what you think. So yeah, you're motivating. Them, motivated, yeah. yeah. So we, we never were rude or crude or unkind, but um, I think the element of just running 5,000 stores takes you a little bit off uh, the element of the human side element, mm -hmm. which is what I love, because I love people, I love humanity, so yeah. Well, that's interesting. So you're, you're, uh, you said you've been out of this now for four years, you built this huge company, very successful, and something happened that changed that. <laughs> I'm aware of it, but let's get into it a little bit. Well, I felt it, mm -hmm. and you know, 16 and 17, you could feel it and uh, something was going on you know you're you're intuitive i'm intuitive mm -hmm. um and of course the higher level of your consciousness which is love and joy and happiness the higher level of your awareness so it wasn't like i didn't sense something was up <clears throat> but we put in a succession plan for the ceo at the time was me but the president was steve ritchie <clears throat> and we started that probably in 14 or 15. and we were trying to groom him in the next level because mm -hmm. um you know, most people make hundreds of millions of dollars to make hundreds of millions more. I made hundreds of millions of dollars so I could enjoy my life and mm -hmm. enjoy my family and enjoy my community and, and give to charity. And so I wanted off. Um, I wanted off the roller coaster in 15 and 16. So we're grooming Richie up, and he's he he just wasn't a CEO. Um, he did a lot of good things. I'd probably if I hired him back again, I'd probably put him as vice president of sales because he's, he's really got the gift of gab. He's very convincing, very smooth. Um, maybe vice president of franchise ops, but not CEO. Mm -hmm. And so as we were trying to groom him to come up, I kept having to kind of come back in. And he um, had another board member, Mark uh, Shapiro. And Mark wanted the marketing business, but he was a board of director. Well, mm -hmm. if I'm the CEO, you're not gonna get the 40 to $80 million of marketing because it's a conflict of interest. Just mm -hmm. unethical, and so Shapiro wanted the marketing. He, he got the he eventually when I got kicked out. He got the forty million. He got ten million um, package mm -hmm. from Endeavor, and Richie got the six million a year because we were going to let him go. So <clears throat> we had a couple of folks on the inside. They hired laundry service. Laundry service was going to get ready to get fired, so they had a vendetta. And then I had a, just a weak board <clears throat> that they really didn't know. They didn't really understand the business, yeah. you know, and. Um, they, you know, they got kind of um, snookered by uh, Shapiro and Richie to, we got to get rid of John. Um, I know that for a fact because Shapiro and Richie called Jordan Zimmerman, our uh, ad agency, and said, hey, we got to get rid of John. This is uh, February, mm -hmm. March of 18. And then once this all happened, uh, the largest franchisee, Nadim Basul, uh, he, uh, he was talking to Richie, he said, why'd you do this to John? And Steve said, I had to because he was going to fire me. So we have two guys on the inside that were complicit. We have a weak board that really doesn't know which way is up. But you got to have, you know, you got to have a board. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to rubber stamp that. It's just public company. And they never really understood the business. And again, we made it look easy. The stock went from 680 to 88 bucks. And so they were complicit in a passive way. And they had this laundry service thing, uh, the agency that's getting ready to get fired. They, this sounds like a you know, corporate mob. It was. It, it was a, <laughs> you know, I know the street mob, but this sounds like corporate mob to me. Oh, it's brutal yeah. to, to, you know, just take me out of it as we sit here. You mm -hmm. know, just okay, 
you, you got somebody that starts in the broom closet, builds 5,000 stores, 34 years. The company's making 165 million bucks a year in pre-tax, 200 million a year in EBITDA. Best place to work in Kentucky for five years. Never had lawsuits, no lawsuits, no surveillance, obviously, no mm -hmm. nonsense. And you hire an agency, they provoke him, they secretly tape it, they release a false narrative to Forbes and destroy the founder, basically, in, in less than, you know, 10 minutes. And the board of directors just throws you over the ship with an anchor tied around your ankle and says, good luck. It's a brutal thing to do to another human being because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't want to be a, a murderer or a rapist or whatever. Sure as heck, in this day and age, you don't want to be accused of being a, a racist. When this first one went down, I kind of laughed. I said, good luck with that one because there's just no history. So basically, you, you were set up. Oh, yeah, we were set this up. This was a setup. Total setup. Yeah. And um, uh, Steve Ritchie, the CEO, and Mark Shapiro with uh, Endeavor, who sat on the board, and Laundry Service, you know, they were all complicit. Yeah, they, they, it was a total setup. You know, by, yeah. by the way, we hired these people to help me. And they did the complete opposite, where they, they um, you know, painted me in a corner of, um, you know, with a false narrative to Forbes that I was a, you know, that I was a racist. It was crazy. Yeah. And this all came from a allegedly remark that you made that was taped or that they, they heard about, a racial remark. You know, the, what I said is I said, you know, they, they hit and hit and hit. And I said, you, are, you, got the, you, know, you guys are crazy. There's just no history of that. Not treating people with kindness and respect. We gave a couple of stories of the history. And they hit one more time and I said, hey, you're, you got the wrong founder. Colonel Sanders calls black people the N-word. I never used that word. Mm -hmm. And they took the first part of the, the recording Papa John's mm -hmm. you know, uses the N-word and, and pretty, well, pretty well blew me up. Well, John, let me tell you this. I happen to be very close. He's a friend and a business associate of somebody that worked with you for 15 years. And he happens to be African-American. He's black. And he has nothing, first of all, he said you were set up. He has nothing but great things to say about you, considers you a friend, and, and enjoyed working with you. As a matter of fact, I believe that after this happened to you, he left the company because he was very upset at what happened, so obviously this was a setup, and it's a shame, it's really. A, well, it's what I call lose, 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 lose. You know, if you're going to have something sustainable in business, you got to have a collaborative alliance, and you have to make it, it's got to be a win for everybody. You know, it's got to be a win. It's got to be a win, win, win. And the employees lost, the city of Louisville lost, the state of Kentucky lost, I lost, my family lost, my friends lost, and Papa John's, you know. Papa John's is trading less today. When I left in 16, it was 88. Today, it's 75 bucks. So it's a yeah. lose. It's just a bad situation. It's a lose, lose, lose for everybody. You know, John, it's not only that. I mean, you know what's happening currently with this cancel culture and everybody being so sensitive. I mean, look, I didn't like it, but, you know, Italians every once in a while were called wops and guineas and all of that. I'm not trying to knock somebody out of their business and change their whole life and destroy them. You know, sometimes things are said without any evil intent or anything like that. But in today's culture, what they're doing is just horrible. You can't, comedians can even joke about things that were funny way back when, you know, not too long ago. And, um, you know, hopefully we share the same feeling of that. I mean, I think it's just ridiculous what's happening today. I really mean it. I think you, you got to look at it from intent. Are you trying to hurt another person? You know, exactly. You know, and um, I think a lot of this cancel culture is created so people don't have to be responsible, don't have to be accountable. And they politicized it to where if you don't think a certain way, then they category you, you know, put you in a, you know, a racist or a bad boss or something. So at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's coming from a high place, to your point, it's very destructive. I do find it bizarre that, like you and I, we got a tightrope to walk on our personal integrity because mm -hmm. we're under the microscope. I mean, you know, you, you, if you slip up or, you know, do something, you, you know, that's just not cool, you got two things. You either take the hit, you know, I slipped, messed up, or two is, you know, if you didn't do it, you, you just, you fight it to the bitter end. But um, the, I don't understand how these employees, you know, they sign up and said, I'll be at work tomorrow at nine o'clock and I'll work a seven hour shift. And then they don't show up. I don't, you know, and yet you and I are held to the standard of, you know, you got to be accountable for what you say and you do. It's when they're, it's an outright lie. You said you'd show up. You said you'd work the seven hours. They let their 
boss down, they let the business down, they let their fellow employees down, they left everybody in a mess because they didn't show up, so now they're short staffed. But more importantly, they, they, their personal integrity, uh, their personal self-respect has gone by the wayside. And you know, if you don't have integrity, you don't have self-respect. If you don't have self-respect, you can't have mutual respect. But it's bizarre to watch the lack of responsibility of you know working uh, you know hard and, and 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 doing your best and showing up on time to where that's just not the norm and I don't know where that's going to take society. Uh, the one thing that scares me going back into Papa John's is right now they don't make a particularly good pizza. Mm. It's not bad pizza, but it's not demonstrably better. It's mediocre at best. Um, our service is not what it used to be, and our cleanliness is not what it used to be. And you. You, if you're going to make the promise better ingredients, better pizza, <clears throat> your fundamentals have to be rock solid. And I'm not sure in, with this workforce is if we can live up to that right now. That's the one thing that scares me if I went back in is, you know, can you hold um, uh, folks accountable for doing a good job? With that being said, I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, I'm always positive. On the darkest night, there's always a few stars shining. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll take Texas Roadhouse or Chick-fil-A. Uh, they're in and out burger. There's somebody out there doing it right. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure out what they're doing, and you know, you know what they're doing right, and how to how to uh, model that and duplicate that. Um, first thing you have to do is you got to give your managers a raise. You know, you can't pay the managers forty, fifty grand a year. You got to get managers in there for a hundred thousand bucks a year. Now, if I said that uh, to the board of directors of Papa John's or the current corporate geniuses. They'd say, "Well, you're you're crazy. It'll destroy our P&L." But I'd, I'd say, "No, you're crazy until we fix the fundamentals of the business, the customer experience. This is uh, this is just a sinking ship." And at 75 bucks a share, the shareholders of Papa John's are sitting on a keg of dynamite. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, China's getting ready to get in trouble. Russia's in trouble. The 450 stores in the UK are in deep trouble. Uh, the largest franchisees in Latin Sea. Um, there's nobody in the U.S. building stores. Um, uh, their transactions are down 30 percent since I left. So that thing is a, a ticking time bomb. And, and the stock was 140, now it's down to 75. And it's, I mean, you, you look at buying that company back at 20 bucks a share, maybe 30, not at 60, 70, even 50. It's just, uh, it's, it's just not worth that kind of money. Well, there it is. You know, I don't know how old you feel about it, but uh, I really enjoyed the interview. Brilliant guy, he really is very perceptive. Some of the things he had to say really struck home with me. And, uh, you know, corporate America sometimes could be very mob-like people. And I think what happened with John was an injustice. And it's proved to be that way. A lot of investigation was done afterwards. John was set up. And what a shame in this country when you can work so hard, start from nothing, build something so great, over 5,000 stores worldwide, one of the premier pizza operations in the world, and then have it all taken away, and, uh, you know, for the wrong reason. I mean, this is a very sincere, honest guy. And to have this happen to him, to have this happen in America, it's just wrong. That's my feelings on it. And I really hope we take hold of what's going on in this country and we don't let things like that happen again, uh, because this is a decent guy. You make one mistake or what, what is perceived to be a mistake, uh, and things like that can happen, uh, just terrible. Anyway, I really enjoyed it. So. That's how it is. I'm getting on a plane. I'm going back home, leaving this beautiful state. I hope you enjoyed it today. And how do I always leave you? Same way. Be safe. Ladies, I always tell you, know your surroundings. So important to know what's going on all around you. Tell my daughters that. My wife, the same thing. Be healthy. You got to take care of yourself. John was talking about that. I might get into some of the things that he was talking about. He's really into pharmaceuticals and medical stuff and all of that. Uh, I, I may really get into it with him. I think we struck up a little bit of a friendship. We'll see. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless every one of you. And you know I really mean that from deep within my heart. And yes, I'll see you next time. Take care.